afternoon. I used to tell people when they said, what's your favorite bit about, what's the favorite thing about your job? What do you enjoy the most? I told them the variety, but after seeing Daniel's talk, I'm gonna have to rethink that. <laughs> I guess I enjoy the view. A little bit about me, I was very lucky I launched uh, for a second space flight two months ago, I was in space two months ago uh, right now, um, on the space shuttle Endeavour on a very exciting mission to the International Space Station with this uh, group of five friends and colleagues here. Here's the International Space Station, 200 miles above the planet, it's there right now and I encourage you all to look for it one night after sunset. We took up with us a huge module, the last permanent piece of the space station. And what's special about this module, once it's attached to the space station, is uh, it had a bay window, the first ever bay window on a spacecraft. And that actually is quite an innovation for a spacecraft. Uh, there we are uh, uh, putting the finishing touches on the outside, Bob and I, and this is why it was one of the most amazing features ever to grace a space station or a spacecraft of any kind. It had a panoramic view of the outside. But I want to ask, why go into space? Because that's a question I get all the time. Historically, there have been many reasons. The first is to explore and to, uh, promote, uh, to promote us as a nation. We go into space to do the science. And of course, people go into space for the view, the view of Earth, which is stunning, and it changes every second. You're traveling about five miles a second over the Earth. Here's the Philippine Islands, for example a place even more beautiful from space than it is when you're down there. But my personal perspective is that we go to space to learn how to live there, something that will be very important for humans a long, long time in the future, and it's good for us to get a start on that. And we also go for the perspective of Earth. It comes both from the view and from the challenges that living in space presents to us. Everybody knows about the challenge of physical adaptation to space flight, especially if you're up there a long time. We put a lot of effort into making sure astronauts stay healthy, and the way we do that today is basically through exercise, very specific exercises. This is a uh, resistive exercise device that uses vacuum. Remember the vacuum. Of course, that used vacuum to resist motion inside some cylinders. Back on Skylab, they used vacuum in an entirely different way to maintain the health of crew. <laughs> you had to stand in it. I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. This is called lower body negative pressure. We know a lot about physical adaptation in space, but I think mental adaptation is actually more interesting, and in the long term, it presents much greater challenges. One of the things you have to do as an astronaut, and this may seem and sound trivial, is that you have to learn to hold on. Obviously, it's extremely important when I'm outside, <laughs> but it's actually surprisingly important when you're inside, too. But for outside, we, uh, we spend a lot of time on the ground training. We have virtual reality that allows us to literally walk hand over hand. You walk with your hands in space around the outside of the space station, never once letting go. We also train underwater for obvious reasons. And if you do let go underwater, the scuba divers, they pull you away. They're under instructions. They pull you away. They leave you in the middle of the pool, and uh, you're on your own. You're on your own to contemplate what that would be like out in space. But more interestingly, you have to learn not to hold on. You can't hold on for two weeks straight. And a first-time flyer will get into the middle of the spacecraft and hold on like they're on the side of Mount Everest. You can't do that for two weeks, as I said. You need to learn how to float in a graceful way without moving around and bumping into people. You have to learn how to eat. You have to relearn how to eat, and there are so many aspects to this. Food is hard to manage. We basically don't prepare food in space because it would be too messy. Uh, we eat it very carefully from packets. It sticks to our spoons, and it carefully makes the journey from packet to mouth. Um, that's a skill that it takes a while to learn. You, you can cook in space. Here is a real innovation that I observed on my flight three years ago. <laughs> my boss, Mark, uh, he used egg as glue. You wouldn't think of doing that at home, would you? Uh, he used egg as glue to make these sausage burritos, breakfast burritos, he called them. He then took paper clips with Velcro, and he stuck the burritos to the wall where he could handle them, and we could all enjoy his culinary expertise. <laughs> food doesn't just present problems going in. Um, food presents problems 
at the other end of its life, lifespan as well. Um, this space toilet is a fantastic piece of innovation. It's actually a vacuum cleaner. Without gravity to keep everything where it should be, you need some other, some other force. Um, and it's not that much fun to use, but I will tell you, it's very, very effective. <laughs> and having said that, living without gravity seems tough. Imagine living without any of the other fundamental forces. It would be even harder. Sleeping in space is easy, but everybody wants to feel, many people want to feel like they're back at home with some weight on the, on the pillow and some weight on the mattress. And so we have these nice straps that you can wear. And it actually takes a while to adapt to this. You need to learn not to need that stuff. Real estate is very limited. I slept on the, on the ceiling, and you can see that every square foot, <laughs> no, I, I really was on the ceiling. Uh, on my previous mission, the other guy had had that spot on the ceiling, so I decided it was going to be mine this mission. It's great. Um, but you can see there are people everywhere. There are bags everywhere. Uh, it's, it's a busy place, and the ceiling is great wasted real estate. Million years of evolution, and in my case, at this point, 42 years of, of living on Earth, had not really prepared me for three dimensions very well. This was a meal in which I couldn't find everybody. I was looking left and right, and I, I just couldn't make eye contact with enough people. I thought, where are they? Somebody spoke, and I looked up, and there was somebody on the ceiling. And it, it seems trivial, but you just don't think about that third dimension until you've been there for a week. And path planning is another example of the same kind of problem. Uh, if you want to get a camera that's up on the wall over there, for your first week in space, you'll scoot along the floor, you'll climb up the wall, and if you're lucky and good and thinking, by the time you get there, you'll say, I could have just floated. It takes a week before the bit of your brain that plans your path catches up with the bit of your brain that says, I need a camera now. And of course, the trivialest things in space are really hard. If I were working at my desk at home and I dropped a pen, this is brilliant. I hear a noise, I look down, and the pen is right there. <laughs> I mean, that's a little known feature of gravity that's really quite handy. In space, this pen behaves, it has a mind of its own. It behaves completely differently. It will very quietly, stealthily move away. <laughs> it will end up behind your head or behind somebody else's. And it may not emerge for a week. We, you know, things go missing for a month, small stuff that you would always find on the floor at your feet here on Earth. I put that in because it's a beautiful picture of 20 metal snakes uh, that we could have lost. You see my pen? It's on the end of a lanyard. I learned that my first space flight. And then once all is said and done, if you've really mastered all these things that it takes about a week to master, you still have what I call space brain. Uh, it's a combination of schedule pressure, um, the busyness of life on orbit, I mean the f visual busyness, uh, a full-headed feeling that comes from fluid shift. There's one of the causes. That's sort of everybody's desk. And this is the result. Now, my friend Steve here, who's one of the smartest men I know, men or women, um, he just made a re he just rehydrated a drink and he'd rehydrated some food and he stuck the straw in the wrong one, and he was about to head off <laughs> and discover this on his own. Fortunately, I had a camera. Fortunately for me, not fortunately for him. <laughs> the other thing about space is the perspective it gives you. Everybody knows that photograph. I think that photograph has done more for the cause of environmentalism than any other photograph taken by anybody ever. Every day in low Earth orbit, we get to see a miracle that is our atmosphere, uh, just an amazing thing. It's like a thin coat of paint on a, on a soccer ball, uh, something we really need to look after. And it changes your view of the air around you. You can think about rising sea levels. You can think about people moving to new places to make room for themselves on an ever-shrinking planet. That's Dubai. And although you can't see many structures from space, you can see runways, and at night you can see cities and roads, what you can see is the effect of government policy. Isn't that strange? You can see policies from space more easily than you can see things. There is a, a volcano in New Zealand surrounded by farmed lands, but you can see very clearly what the government has said, there won't be any farming here. The policy is visible. And of course, space forces you to act locally. We make all our own power. We have to. We can't import gas. 
The reason we can't import gas is that everything is 200 miles below you, but more importantly, everything is 17,500 miles behind you. 500 miles per hour, sorry, behind you. And if you think about the energy for the physicists in the audience, that means that every pound of mass up on the space station, 10% of its energy, potential and kinetic, is potential, and 90% of it is kinetic. So it's really most appropriate to think of things as being 17,500 miles per hour behind you. We monitor everything carefully, and we have been doing for decades, the way we will in homes in the future. And we recycle everything. Here's Steve, that same brilliant gentleman I showed you earlier, is connecting the uh, urine recycler in the, uh, in the node that we took up, turning yesterday's coffee into tomorrow's tea. And I think the yellow shirt, the yellow shirt was designed not to tempt fate. If he'd worn a white one, it might have ended up yellow. So in closing, I hope that many of you will get to experience spaceflight for the challenges it presents and for the innovations that will drive you to. If you do, you may go up with these guys. These are great innovators. Spaceship One, built by Bert Rutan. And I'd like to remind you that innovation isn't just a force that changes the world. When you've seen the world from space, you come to hope that innovation will be a force that sometimes prevents the world from changing too much. Thank you.